Hey guys, welcome back! So, point and click adventure games was the genre that made me convert myself into a PC gamer back in 1993. It was a really huge deal for me back in early 90s. So, let's take a look at my 10 all-time classics. I firstly started playing point-and-click adventure games by around 1990 on my Amiga 500, but the dreadful disc swapping routine made me quickly forget the genre on that system. It was until late 1993 that I got full steam back to point-and-click adventure games, but this time around on my brand new IBM PS1. Paired with a mind-blowing 170 megabytes of hard disk space, now I could simply install the contents of all the 3.5-inch floppy disks and later from CDs and run the games directly from the hard drive. The disk swapping era was over. It quickly became my favorite genre to play on PC for several years. But if it wasn't for Steve Jobs with his 1984 Apple Macintosh and its mouse-driven graphical interface, the genre will probably come too late and missed its momentum. Even so, Maniac Mansion from Lucasfilm Games is credited for being the title that set the point-and-click graphic adventure genre in motion with its verb interface based upon the company's innovative scum scripting system. It was really hard to come up with my 10 favorite games cause I really love the genre, so in the end of this video I'll be pointing out 10 honorable mentions. Without further ado, here's my 10 all-time classic point-and-click graphic adventure games. Beneath the Steel Sky Taking place in a dystopian industrial future, what really pops out in Beneath the Steel Sky are the beautifully hand-drawn backgrounds. Revolution's second adventure, initially available for MS-DOS and Amiga back in 1994, had a huge help from renowned British artist Dave Gibbons, also responsible for the comic book limited series Watchman. But not only the visual beauty of this title deserves the spotlight, it's an overwhelming story and the soundtrack is short of amazing, a complete package of pure awesomeness. Beneath the Steel Sky is a brilliant atmospheric adventure built using Revolution's virtual theater engine used in their 1992 first adventure, Lear of the Temptress. So in this one we play the role of Robert Foster along with his pet robot Joey that also can be used to solve puzzles and upgraded with spare parts. Along with two more from this list, it was one of the last point-and-click graphic adventures that I've played all through to the end. By then, market was shifting towards the first-person shooter revolution and everyone was looking forward for Doom 2 that would be released 7 months after Beneath the Steel Sky and also Star Wars Dark Forces that would arrive in 1995. Excuse me. Better be careful I don't fall in there. Star Trek 25th Anniversary 
In 1992, Interplay developed indoors a point-and-click graphic adventure based on the Star Trek universe. And after playing Star Trek 25th Anniversary, I felt the urgent need to watch all movies from this amazing franchise. But let's be honest, I've always preferred the Star Wars universe. But sadly, there was never a Star Wars based point-and-click graphic adventure, so I was extremely pleased with this one. The authentic feel with sound effects, the memorable soundtrack and the original cast and their voices, all taken directly from the movies and TV series, was what made this game so enjoyable. It was a near thing. But the visual design is amazing and extremely well implemented, and even the box art looks like it was taken directly from a Star Trek movie poster. Still trying to regain his strength. The game is broken into a series of episodes and split between adventure mode and the bridge mode, in where we take control of the ship. It, appears it allowed the developers to tell several stories within the game, just like if it was a Star Trek TV show and probably ended up influencing the episodic adventures released in recent past. On screen, Lieutenant. We have read your report on the problems at College Spy. So be it. You have been warned. Prepare to die. Mm. Now, here's a game that I played and finished on my Amiga 500 after I heard about it in another LucasArts monkey-related adventure by 1990 and fell in love with its aesthetics. Four years later, ended up giving Gloom a second chance, this time around on DOS. Featuring its unique musical interface, it also premiered the concept of no dying that would later be implemented in other LucasArts titles. The designers wanted to offer a simple, comfortable and relaxing way of playing a graphic adventure without being trapped in dead ends or constantly worried about avoiding death traps of some kind. In this fantasy-driven adventure, gameplay is centered around magical four-note tunes known as drafts, and each draft is a spell with its own effect and can even be reversed by playing the notes backwards. Drafts can be learned by carefully observing objects and as we progress through the story, additional notes will be available offering the chance to play newer and more complex drafts. Sounds weird? Yeah, probably. That's why Loom ended up being highly misunderstood, cause it was ages ahead of its time due to the introduction of this unfamiliar and completely new way of playing point-and-click graphic adventure games. The D. Does the name Steven Spielberg sound familiar? Yeah, that's right! The Dig was inspired by a Steven Spielberg's powerful sci-fi story intended for the filmmaker's own Emmy Award winner TV series Amazing Stories that aired on NBC from 1985 to 1987. The Dig's story was even intended to be later converted into a full-length feature film. However, they've concluded that, by the end of the 80s, it would become epically expensive to put together. So, after witnessing the success of LucasArts' graphic adventure of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, a meeting was held at the Skywalker Ranch by October the 17th of 1989, the day when the Loma Prieta earthquake shook Northern California and the San Francisco Bay Area. So, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Ron Gilbert and Noah Falstein would get together to discuss the game's design. And The Dig was LucasArts' title, with the longest development time being only released by November of 1995 for DOS and macOS. Unlike previous LucasArts adventure games, The Dig offered an obscure and darker tone to its own plot. In a distant future, a large asteroid is on a collision course with Earth and were assigned to plant explosives on its surface in order to try to prevent such a catastrophic occurrence. Though we end up discovering that the asteroid is hollow and being transported to this high-tech alien world. Voice acting from Robert Patrick and Stephen Blum were praised along with its orchestral soundtrack. 
Based upon LucasArts' own iMuse engine that synchronizes music with the visual action on screen. With all these ingredients and with this space theme involving alien technology, I got so hyped to keep on advancing through the story in a time where there wasn't practically nowhere to go for clues, hints or tips. Its puzzles were indeed quite harsh and painful, so I can firmly state that The Dig was the most challenging graphic adventure that I've ever played. And I love it for that! Another ghost. King's Quest 6. I always recall this sixth title of the King's Quest franchise with huge nostalgia. Five friends and I saved money for months to buy the original Boxed DOS version and managed to do it a year after the game's release. Prince Alexander of Dapper. So, in late 1993, and after playing a pirated copy of the previous title, no the 3D graphic intro movie, the professional voice acting, and the multiple routes through the story overwhelmed us. It just blew us away. Obviously, that we needed to make copies of the original floppy disks so that each of us would play it and share experiences, helping each other advancing through the story. Every day at school, we would gather around and talk about each other's progression, and this was how we shared walkthroughs in early 90s. We would even draw sketches for the puzzles and take photocopies so that when we got home, could advance a bit more. It was the first point-and-click graphic adventure that I played on my brand new IBM PS1 with sound coming only from the PC speaker. Sound cards and a pair of speakers were so expensive back in those days, a luxury, so King's Quest VI was played entirely using the internal speaker of my IBM that gladly had this pretty handy volume knob so that I could play the game all night long. King's Quest VI brought huge improvements to the series and could finally rival LucasArts' graphic adventures with its awe-inspiring visual beauty. An amazing experience that brings so many awesome memories. A maiden, lovely and pure. Indiana Jones and the Lost Crusade Prior to the 1989 point-and-click graphic adventure of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, I had already a taste of the genre with Maniac Mansion on a Commodore 64. And prior to that, with Larry's and Wilco's first text-based adventures. But besides being based on my favorite Indiana Jones movie, the first point-and-click graphic adventure that I've ever played on my own home computer was this one, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Here's my original Kix re-release of the Amiga game, one of the few back from those days that wasn't sold and managed to survive all these years. If I recall correctly, the graphic adventure was released for Amiga, Atari ST, Mac, PC and FM Town simultaneously with the premiere of the movie, and if that wasn't enough, there was also an extremely difficult action game for 8 and 16 bit systems like the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC, C64, Amiga, Atari ST, Sega Mega Drive, Genesis, Game Boy, NES, etc. that I've also enjoyed playing, cause it perfectly captured the essence of the movie. So, making a video game based on a movie is a piece of cake, but making a good video game based on a movie is rather difficult. Lucasfilm Games, rebranded to LucasArts a year later, masterfully achieved that. The video game was as good as the movie and were completely immersed into this amazing adventure. It featured a clever IQ score system that would engage players to find alternate solutions to puzzles and thus giving this game a high replay value. I can't simply recall how many times I got back to this game. I've already reviewed it. It was, in fact, one of my early reviews for the channel. Check it out if you're curious! Broken Sword, Shadow of the Templars 
I've always had a sweet spot for history, the birth of civilizations and their amazing architectural achievements. Just like in the previous game of this top 10 list, the Crusades and the Knights Templar always fascinated me, cause the ones that escaped the Inquisition from the church ended up in Scotland, Switzerland and in my dear Portugal. So it was with no surprise that I got really excited when this first chapter of the Broken Sword franchise was announced and that it would have a story related to the Templars. It was highly praised after release, winning several awards, its cinematic storytelling proved to be completely different from Sierra's and LucasArts graphic adventures. It also incorporated comical and hilarious situations, but the fascinating and engaging plot was what really grabbed my attention. It's had that historically inspired feeling, if you know what I mean, that I simply love in a game or movie, cause it was influenced by the 1982 controversial book The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. Charles Cecil, Revolution's founder and the brain also behind Beneath the Steel Sky, turned a religious conspiracy theory into a freaking amazing and enjoyable adventure that Dan Brown would later be inspired by and become millionaire with his Da Vinci Code book. Why sure, son? The Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 The Chuck's Revenge Ah, the secret of Monkey Island! The first thing that comes in mind is the dreadful disc swapping that annoyed me so freaking much when playing this game on my Amiga 500 for the first time. It completely ruined the experience. Meanwhile, a year later, came the sequel, LeChuck's Revenge, that I played a couple of times at a friend's house and also loved it. By 1993, when I finally got my very own PC, I managed to grab a copy of the very first Monkey Island, installed it on the hard drive and was immediately sucked in and completely fell in love with the franchise. The Secret of Monkey Island was probably the most influential point-and-click video game from its time, and its sequel offered a much larger adventure and two difficulty levels with more puzzles to solve. These two are probably the funniest video games ever made, not forgetting their amazingly beautiful pixel art. The insult sword fighting, the exploratory feeling, the weird and stupid combination of items, the constant ability to trick death, all these virtues were highly inspirational and motivational. We just wanted to keep on going, solving one more puzzle and unveil the secret of the monkey island. Speaking about death, we could in fact die if we stayed underwater for more than 10 minutes, but who would try such a thing? Back in late 2015, I've reviewed and told the complete story of the very first Monkey Island, also celebrating its 25th anniversary, so feel free to check that one out. Day of the Tentacle Now, here's the sequel to the title credited for being the very first point-and-click graphic adventure. Maniac Mansion set the tone for things to come and Day of the Tentacle was the pinnacle of craziness and weirdness in the genre. Day of the Tentacle is probably the title that most perfectly fits the answer to the question what is an adventure game? Just like Castlevania Symphony of the Night answers the most famous question in video games history. What is a man? Spread out commando style. Laverne? Day of the Tentacle isn't just an adventure game, it's a mix of that ingredient with comedy, strong characters, puzzles, love and different worlds packed with different stuff. Day of the Tentacle is all that and much more. Yes, thank you. There's three different characters working together in the past, present and the future to defeat the evil purple tentacle that is trying to take on the world. 
There's a bit of American history depicted in this game's past that was quite complicated to come around. Back then, cause yeah, my teacher was more focused in Portuguese history and ancient civilizations, but hey, don't let that little bit scare you. Otherwise, you'll be missing out one of the most beautiful graphic adventure games ever created that was even remastered for the current gen systems and I'm playing it right now on my PS4 all over again. But now, I know... Don't worry, guys. This time I know I can stop him. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis You've already noticed that I'm the biggest Indiana Jones fan out there and The Fate of Atlantis should be turned into a movie and remastered for current gen systems like Day of the Tentacle was. Screenwriter Al Barwood, that would return later to also write the story for Infernal Machine, wrote an amazing plot centered around the lost continent of Atlantis. I've forever been intrigued with Plato's amazing Atlantis dialogue, so The Last Crusade was begging for a sequel, and it eventually arrived firstly in 1992 and a year later in an enhanced CD-ROM version which included amazing voice acting and digitized sound effects. This was the one that I've played back then and played again and again and again. First mentioned by Plato. Now it offered an overwhelming and original story that can rival with the ones from the three first movies. The fourth one is quite forgettable, so Nazis, a sort of mythological flavor and a beautiful and somewhat annoying female character were the perfect ingredients for an Indiana Jones adventure. Sophia Apgood would return later for Indy's first 3D action adventure, The Infernal Machine, released in 1999 and that I've also reviewed in the past. Needless to say that later I would also grab the GOG and Steam versions to play again and again and again. Damn, I completely lost the count of how many times I've played and finished The Fate of Atlantis. It still has the power to held my attention hostage like if there was no tomorrow. And let's not forget that this game was included as an unlockable extra of the Wii version of Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings. 25 years later, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis refuses to die and I truly hope that somewhere in the near future we'll receive another suitable adventure worthy of the presence of the man in the hat himself. Out straight lines. Graphic adventures from LucasArts dominated the market back in those days. The high quality of their products completely drowned out all competition. Later, the rise of the first-person shooter genre practically eradicated point-and-click graphic adventures. Even so, its spirit lives on in titles like Rockstar's LA Noir. In this video's description, there's the direct links for grabbing these games and if you've enjoyed my top 10, please like, share and subscribe to It's a Pixel thing. Also, feel free to leave below your personal favorites, I'm curious to know. Click on these other examples for more amazing stories from the golden age of video games. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode.